Hey, you're listening to KVNF 90.9 in Paonia and KVMT 89.1 in Montrose. You know, this is Emotional Rescue, and it's time to emotionally rescue those people who made this whole thing happen. A few dreamers that started KVNF. KVNF is a reality. Good evening, this is KVNF in Paonia, Colorado. Now beginning a broadcast day, rather it's first broadcast day. KVNF is owned and operated by community licensee North Fork Valley Public Radio Incorporated, a Colorado not-for-profit corporation. KVNF is a Class D educational FM radio station operating at the assigned frequency of 90.9 megahertz with an effective radiated power of 14 watts as authorized by the Federal Communications Commission in Washington, D.C. KVNF studios and transmitter are located at Sawwood Orchards, two miles northeast of Paonia, Colorado, on Garvin Mesa. The KVNF, KVNF business office and production studios are located in room four, the Bears Den, at 213 Grand Avenue in Paonia, Colorado. There's a thing up on the top that says Belmont, so I guess it's the Belmont building. Uh, as I like to say to people, that and $2.50 gets you in the subway, you know. It was founded, as we all know, by Campbell Stanton. We started fundraising uh, whatever we could garner in this small community, and, and by 1979 we had all the paperwork done and some money in the bank, and uh, we got a license to put on a a uh, small Class D 10-watt radio station right here in Paonia. And, and we had remodeled this garage and put a nice floor in it and carpet and remodeled the walls and put in the radio station type windows. And From the outside it looked like a storage shed, but on the inside it, it was, was rather it was great. nice. It was very nice. For all the grandeur of this new building and everything, there was nothing, there's nothing here quite comparable to that little studio up in Garvin Mesa at sunset, and you would be working there and look up, and there would be a deer outside the window looking in. It was convenient to have KVNF at my house, uh, and it, the rent was right because it was zero. Uh, but it, it didn't take too long before we realized it really needed to be in, to, in the town, in, in here in Paonia. So I think about nine months after. Uh, we started broadcasting from there, and we actually had maintained our offices down here. Mm-hmm. And we negotiated something with the Bears, a, a new lease or something for all the building. Yeah, it used to be a boarding house for ma- for the miners. Um, and it was, it was just one long little room, like a single wide trailer, like a long single wide shotgun housing, I think they called it at one time. Boy, that place was incredible. It had almost like little cells <laughs> with a window to the hall, and that was it. I guess it was some sort of little temporary boarding house or something. But, uh, that was for, for bachelor miners, you know. All yeah, it had a bathroom, two bathrooms in the back and a shower and one of the, one room back there. Yeah. yeah I, I remember in the old, horrible, funky, terrible building where I was in the very back end of the hall and the closest neighbor I had there was the men's room. And it was hell working in that building, but it had all its wonderful idiosyncrasies. When we were in the, our old studio, which was nothing like the glory of, of this. <laughs> you never wore movie. white, because you would be filthy by the time you came home. And in some ways, it was a, it was a difficult <laughs> place. There were mice, and I remember doing a program one evening and being fascinated by this mouse that came out from the walls underneath where the, where the board was and everything, and came around and he finally jumped up to get in the, in the waste paper basket because there was some trash there and a little food. But, and he got in the waste paper basket, but then it was too high for him to get out. And he kept jumping up and down <laughs> trying to get out of the waste paper basket. <laughs> You're cute. Ooh. Oh boy. Boy. Okay. That's a lucky Bye. man, too. 
Right. Let's do this every Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We wouldn't have any of this without Felix. There's no doubt about that. Because nobody could say no to Felix. Well, wow, that's not that's not true. That's that's a legendary story. No, all joking aside, the one thing that I felt I could do, and which I did do to a certain extent, was I was able to connect with the people of my own generation and age in the community and convince them that this KVNF thing was serious and this was not a bunch of hippies. This was a serious, worthwhile enterprise. We live in a place that's just inspiring. You know, you get up and you come down here to work and you're inspired and you know, you look, at, I, I think our library is pretty impressive. I'm, I'm very proud of it. Um, but I think there's just a huge opportunity, you know, because you might wake up one day and say, wow, I really feel like rocking. And you might wake up the next day and say, wow, I really feel like reggae. Or I really feel like jazz and you have it's available to you here to go into the library and, you know, take your inspiration and just run with it. The power of KVNF is the um, tremendous creativity of this community, which has, has just, for whatever reason, I've thought about it a lot. I think it has to do somewhat with the landscape, is um, inspiring. And so people who choose to live here are, are tapped into that source of inspiration and usually are sharing that inspiration in how they comport themselves in their lives. And so it all kind of grows and it mixes. There's also quite, quite a um, diverse group of people who've come together with very different backgrounds that public radio united here because people were aware of what public media is about when they moved here. And I can't tell you how many times people have said to me, um, this is one of the reasons I chose to relocate in this small rural area because I was concerned about being connected. When I knew there was a community radio station, I knew that I would have something here. In 1986, we flew to Grand Junction, rented a car, Drove up over the Grand Mesa, came out on, um, what is that, Route 92 at that point? It's 92, yeah, 92. off of 65. And turned left instead of right. Ended up in Paonia, discovered there was a radio station here and said, civilization, we could live in this place because there's a public radio station here. We have DJs who literally cover every every major genre for sure and a lot of genres that are that are off off the mainstream and every one of those DJs has listeners and every one of them feels a, a part of this station um, it's just magical it really is you, you never feel like an outsider at KVNF another thing that this radio station is doing is encouraging more and more young people starting as young as I would say grade school to be involved with radio. Well I think it's inevitable. I mean we're really fortunate that we have a really um, bright youth group in this valley. I mean we have a lot of alternative kind of lifestyles and it. It, it produces really great kids and people. But I see them, when I see them come in here, I mean, I've seen kids come in here that have never, they don't even know what an LP is. They never saw a record. I mean, some of the comments you see if they go back into the vinyl library or you hear is, is fascinating. But I think, I think like most people that come into this studio or this facility, including myself, sometimes I walk in here and you're just awed by it all. You're awed by the, the state-of-the-art technology that we have. You can be awed by the amount of music we have. You can be awed, awed by the art we have on the walls, the beautiful photography we have on the walls. And you can just be awed by the simple fact 
that anybody can walk in here, they can use our production room, they can perform in our bamboo room, they can train and sit at a beautiful console and play whatever they want to play. I love the fact that I'll, I'll take off my vinyl cuts as you're coming in and setting up your iPod. I mean, it's like, we covered it, man. It is so cool that, that we are able to do that. We have a facility that allows us to do that. And uh, so when a, when a kid comes in, he might be really hip to his tweeter, Twitter, and iPod business, but we can also hip him to, uh, to vinyl and show him there's a lot of great stuff that was, was done on 78s. And I think the accessibility and the, the availability is something that um, I'm hoping is the kids respond to because I know there's a whole world out there that I'm kind of a little hostile to or, or not that friendly to. And I think it goes both ways. I think, you know, they come in here and they don't get that. They understand that there's a little bit of everything. It makes me feel pretty good about myself. My mom always told me she grew up in Denver. She said that she always wanted to be on the radio. And she never could because it's too big of an area. And it makes me feel like uh, I get to do something fun and get me off my butt and do something. You know, it comes down to the fact change is good. And, and youth, it's important, you know, to have youth. It's important to have the wisdom of a Felix Belmont. So we've got it all, and I think that's something, I think a lot of radio stations tend to compartmentalize themselves. They don't want to be old-fashioned and have a vinyl library. They, they don't want anything to do with digitization. And you can't, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You've got to combine it all, and you have to. That's why I'm happy to continue with CDs and vinyl and do some downloads and audio vault, because I think then you just attract the people that want, they, they get what they want and the listener is the final one that gets what they want. One of the romances of the radio to me is that sometimes I turn it on and I hate it. <laughs> I turn something on, I'm like, what is this? And then I'll turn it off. I'll go take a shower, do some work, make dinner, turn it back on, and I love it. And it's just, it's romantic, the idea that anybody can play anything for anyone here. Um, it's kind of beautiful. It's really beautiful. The biggest difference for me is non-top 40. Uh, we're getting to hear things that are from, this morning for instance, there was a DJ on there playing a mix from uh, a different DJ and it was from the 70s. And it was great, I was singing along to uh, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Carol King. Um, they had a bunch of good stuff on there this morning. It's kind of my link to new music too. And, and if she plays a song that I like, um, I know pretty much it's going to fit into a general genre of other music, and so I get to hear a lot of artists I've never heard before. And I'm finally figuring out how to use the internet and go and look at her playlists and see what she's played and, and look up a song that I might have liked and then go listen to the whole parts of the whole album on iTunes or something like that. So it's expanded my music world a lot too, just through, through the whole internet connection. And then them talking, I really appreciate that they tell us what they've just played. And, um, and making some of the connections between the different artists. That's really been, that's been an eye opener, an ear opener for me too. The difference in public radio and community radio is best defined by the fact that community radio relies on at least 65 to 75 percent volunteers for their programming. So we are, we are tangibly tying ourselves to the general public for content. Whereas the public media system is one that has a whole layer of larger market stations that rely on paid professional staff. It's still non-commercial. It's still listener supported. 
but it is not your friends and neighbors walking through the door, answering the phones, creating a music program, volunteering to cover their kids' soccer game and bring back the information. That's our model. And that's why I say community development is what we do and we happen to broadcast over the radio airwaves. That's, that's the really the main difference. And I would argue that community radio is better positioned to navigate the future landscape and to sustain a funding model that'll work than any other radio in the system right now. The difference is in mission. The big corporate community public radio stations, the, the Colorado Public Radios, the, the Minnesota networks or whatnot, their mission is to make money. They program to make money so that they could keep their network of news and classical. You'll notice that they program to their fundraising. They don't program to the community. Our mission is different. We're community oriented and our programming serves our community. And within that framework, we make the money we need to fulfill that mission. It's where you're coming from is totally different. Look at this building today, Steve. You're making a movie in one of our studios. A volunteer is in the air studio creating, you know, a, a music mix and is actually participating, in my view, in cultural preservation by keeping this kind of Cajun music from the New Orleans happening and people aware of what it is. Out in the hallway, a second volunteer is gearing up for a new music show that'll take over this afternoon. News producers are working on stories and local headlines. And then in the evenings, a group of kids is coming in here to rehearse a musical for a local community theater production. Okay, I mean, that's everybody using media, but having a central nexus where they can come together and have a shared experience. Because I don't care how many bells and whistles you get on a computer, human beings need to be around human beings. We are social creatures. And, and just a click is not gonna do it. Because 70% of communication by many thinkers um, has has basically been thought of as nonverbal communication. You can't cut it out completely. So that's why we said, yep, we see what's going on with this thing, but we want a building. <laughs> we want a place where people can convene. This building that we're in, uh, parts of which are over 100 years old, was called Joe's Bar. On the day that KVNF first signed on the air, this was the local bar and there was even a little deli inside. And we had the party to celebrate KVNF's first day of broadcasting right here in the, in the room behind me, which is now the KVNF office. One of the favorite things for me about KVNF and the new studio is that it's part of my tour of town for visitors. I take them to the KVNF studio and brag about how it's better than the national studio in Washington. And the folks are just blown away about it. This, in a town of 1,600 people, we've got a world-class facility. You were mentioning volunteers and how they are the heart of this station as opposed to the paid staff. There is paid staff, but you walk into that marvelous space, uh, the new building, and you look around and there are photos, absolutely fabulous photos, lining all of the walls. These are all of the people who are volunteers at KVNF, who are part of the family of KVNF, and that sometimes is an overused word, perhaps, but not in this case. I think it's a mirror of the community. We've talked about receiving information coming in from the outside, but it also shares what it, what's going on in our community and shows it back to the people who are here uh, audibly in a way that uh, other, other public radio stations just wouldn't have the opportunity to do. That's good. That reminds me <laughs> that it's the mirror, reminds me of, of the joke about consultants, of which I was a pretty successful one for a while, that he's the guy who walks in and borrows your watch and then tells you what time it is. That's the wrong image. The image, the real image is he's the guy who can hold up the mirror so you can see.
And that's what this radio station does for our town. It holds up the mirror so we can see. I used to live in a room full of What's your name? What's your name? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy?